is that is the challenge in the surf. It's not lack of oxygen, it's excess carbon dioxide. Welcome to the Surf Mastery Podcast. We interview the world's best surfers and the people behind them to provide you with education and inspiration to surf better. Today my guest is Nam Baldwin. Nam is a highly qualified emotional and stress control management specialist. He is the co-developer of the internationally recognized BET or breath enhancement training. He's a life coach, a motivational coach, a health coach. He has trained world champions including Mick Fanning, Steph Gilmore and some Olympic gold medalists as well. Um, Nam, tell me about what is breath enhancement training? It's a program that we put together about uh, probably 12, 15 years ago now to assist all surfers in the beginning in in dealing with the high pressure moments that we have when we go for a surf. So hold downs, uh, surfing bigger waves um, and dealing with moments where you really go into a bit of a stressed state, how to improve a number of elements around that. So how to improve your breath hold safely when you're under stress. Uh, how to improve your breathing to help self-regulate the way in which your nervous system responds, so that fight-or-flight response, and then how to how to really allow yourself to reset from challenging moments too, so that when you're out the back, if you've just got through and you're like, holy moly, this is this is heavy out here, how to self-regulate one's thoughts and and behaviour so that you can perform on a high level. You're not going to get in the way of yourself. And all of that stuff can be affected through your breathing? Yeah, predominantly. That's the foundation of it all. I mean, your, your breathing is the the most important part of how to self-regulate. You know, the, the first thing that changes when you get stressed is your breath, which then affects your heartbeat, which then affects the way in which your nervous system operates, nervous system being that fight-flight response or freeze response that we go into. So the better your breathing is... Um, excuse me, under pressure, the better you can you can regulate your response to the stress that you're going through. Okay, so so how do you mean by better? So very simply, if if um, if I'm going under stress, that the important thing is that my breathing is rhythmic and even, uh, and that I'm using my muscles, the breathing muscles that I have in a in a correct sequence. So. Predominantly breathing in air low into my lungs before it goes up to the upper part of my chest. A lot of us, when we get stressed, we become high chest breathers and breathe shallow and rapid uh, and irregular. So as soon as we we breathe a little slower, uh, a little lower, and then make that breathing more even and rhythmic, the heart is then assisted in the way in which it pumps blood and oxygen around the body and primarily to the brain where it's so more effective at the job that it has to do because the breathing is better. So rhythmic breathing can influence your heartbeat? Totally. Okay. Yeah, so we've got various um, little devices that we, we illustrate that live on a screen where people can see their heart beating relative to the way in which they're breathing. And if you're breathing shallow, erratic, or fast, erratic, your heart is interfered by that way of breathing and and how it's interfered is that your heart actually sits in a bag called a pericardium and attached to the bottom of that bag is your diaphragm so if your diaphragm isn't moving much when you breathe in and out it isn't assisting your heart as much as it could if it was so the diaphragm which is your primary in-breath muscle when used effectively assists in stretching that bag out, elongating the heart and sucking blood or assisting blood moving into the heart so that when it then pushes back up when we breathe out, now the heart's being pushed up via the diaphragm and helping expel blood out of it. So it becomes a second pump. Okay. So your heart kind of recognizes, hey, there's a nice rhythmic breathing going on through the diaphragm. I'm going to jump on that and and time myself to be more efficient. Yeah, and, and have you know, greater movement so that it doesn't have to beat as as hard, so to speak, to get the blood in and out. It's being assisted mm. and therefore less stress and load on it. Okay, which and that directly affects your your nervous system. Yeah, so interestingly, every time your heart beats, it's sending a message around your body 
in relation to the state in which it is in and the uh, experience in which your body is going through. So the better your heart beats, the more it regulates the nerves that travel away from it through various means to, to signal that you're in control or you're in a state of co uh, coherence, which is ability for systems to work effectively together. So the better the heart beats, the better the nervous system operates. Okay. When we experience a stressful situation, we, we tend to go into what's sometimes called re reflexive breathing. And for, <laughs> for those listening, it's, it's sort of like, <sighs> that sort of breathing, isn't it? Yeah. And the, the body kind of naturally does that, doesn't it? Now, why does it do that? And why is that bad? Yeah, it does it because it's trying to increase the amount of oxygen coming into your body so that it can process what's going on and then give you an abundance of oxygen so that you can run or fight from whatever's going on around you. Um, you just probably have not uh, entrained yourself to breathe effectively when that stimulus kicks into gear. So normally... You know, in ancient day when that happened, when you got very stressed, your breathing would increase because you were taking action, you were taking flight. Um, we may have forgotten how to breathe effectively to improve that response. So it doesn't take much. That's the other thing too. It doesn't take much to teach someone and for them to entrain that response to be way better, to breathe when the stimulus kicks in in a slightly more meaningful way, a bit more even, a bit more rhythmic, a bit more intent behind your breath and then you're assisting yourself yeah uh, i guess from a practical s sense in my own experience it's been you know if you have a a nice a quite a, a good beating or a good hold down in some sizey surf and you might manage to um you know get back out the back to safety and you're sitting out the back and you just you just realize that you're 100 percent absolutely flogged and wiped out and basically your surf <coughs> your surf is over so mm. is is regaining control of your breath uh, a way to influence and kind of push the reset button on, on a surf like that in that situation? Absolutely. So, you know, predominantly you've probably gone into a big oxygen debt um, yep. and a carbon dioxide excess, meaning that you're feeling fairly lactic and heavy. So with good breathing, you'll repay the oxygen debt fairly quickly. You'll get rid of the excess lactic or carbon dioxide and then the systems that allow you to work effectively, the muscular, respiratory, cardiovascular systems, will come back into an operating place where you'll feel quite good. <laughs> but you just might need a couple of minutes to get that to happen through really progressive breathing, which is generally just even and rhythmic, and things will come back into play. Okay. So for folks listening, would you suggest a particular time signature to, to try? To time as in how long they have to breathe in that manner for? or Well, let's say you're in that situation. You've had a heavy hold down. You realize um, you know, neurologically you're, you're, you're wiped out, but you manage to yep. get back out the back to safety. Yeah. Uh, should they, is there a particular, you know, how many seconds in, how many seconds out? Okay, see what you're saying. Yeah, so, well, whatever the body requires, and you're aiming for, I guess the best way to, to sort of illustrate it is, you know, initially you're going to have to use your mouth to breathe and you'll use your mouth to breathe in and out based on the, the urgency to breathe and breathing heavy. And when you feel that you can use your nose to breathe in and your mouth to breathe out, go to that phase and that will mean that your heart rate is dropping and uh, your nervous system's calming down. And then when that becomes easy, go to nose, nose. Now that may take, you know, a period of time based on your fitness, in terms of how long do you breathe in for and out for, well, at the beginning of that stress response, whatever's required, as long as you're focusing on getting the air low in the lungs and then high as a, as a process. Because to say, you know, five seconds in, five seconds out, et cetera, it may not be right for an individual. They may need shorter, longer, whatever works for them. But as long as it is fairly even and rhythmic, Okay, so that sounds like that's key, right? The rhythm of the breathing. That's right. Yeah, and if you you know if you look at a, a really good runner, a really good surfer who's paddling out effectively, their breathing will will be very even and rhythmic. There'll be consistency. 
Okay. So is that another thing you might recommend to surfers to, to breathe uh, in time with your stroke? You could do. You could use that or you could just follow your breath with your mind. When you do that, you will become even and more rhythmic with your breathing. So it's just a something that you could focus on for a short period of time to get it into that way of breathing. So, it's amazing what will happen when you put your mind on something. So follow your breath with your mind. Yeah, so if you breathe in, just follow it. And then when you breathe out, follow it. Um, you'll create a rhythmic even breath when you do that. Okay, just by coming more aware. That's right. Wow. And Quite a simple process. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell us what did you do with Mick Fanning? We, intro we got introduced uh, way back in, I think it was 2006, 2007 maybe? No, 2007. Uh, through his coach, Phil Mack, mm -hmm. uh, when I was just basically uh, teaching people a lot of the bet training and I invited Phil because he had a couple of, you know, obviously had Mick, but also had a couple of other really good surfers in his, in his group and he was keen to see and hear what the training was all about. Uh, took him through a session and he, him and his guys had a profound shift in how they, how they felt, how they performed in the session. They, they got tremendous gain from it all and, and then he basically recommended it to Mick, he, he said to Mick, I think this is a good thing for you to do. And um, we then came together and I took him through a session and, and challenged him. And, and that's, uh, that's where it all began. He loved the challenge and, and the information backed with the practices that we teach just have such good real application to real life stuff. So it started from there. Okay. So, I, you know, any any pro surfer is is often and always putting themselves in quite stressful situations. So it's partly it sounds like the, this breathing has got a lot to do with stress management, right? Of course. Okay, of and course. That, that enhances your awareness and your focus. Absolutely. And then there's other things that we teach in relation to other physical attributes that that will assist you under pressure that that need to be bolted on to good breathing. And then that helps regulate the emotional side of things. Um, and again, keeping it incredibly simple with a simple application of a physical thing that you do to keep your brain calmer under pressure. Okay. Are we talking posture posture, or a trigger move? or? Yeah. So, so yeah, posture is a good place to, to be. But um, the use of your eyes actually has a, has a profound impact on your stress response. So making sure that on a consistent basis you're – you know, going into what we call open focus or a gaze um, as you're approaching something that may be stressful. So if I'm paddling out, I'd, I'd want to tend to be more aware of the peripheral of my vision, not narrowly focusing on the impact zone of what's just in front of me or about to hit me. I'm still have an awareness of that space, but I also have awareness of the peripheral of my vision and that calms my brain down. Okay, that's interesting. I haven't heard that one before. So is that kind of like a, a relaxation of the eye muscles? Is that part of yeah, it? Yeah, kind of, yeah. So if you had, um, you know, easiest way to sort of talk about it is, you know, if, if you eyeball someone, if you go very close and look at someone's eyes and then you put your hands to the side of uh, the person's head, but look at their eyes but be very aware of the hands on the corners of your peripheral, you'll find it a lot more comfortable mm. because you're now going into more open focus. So narrow focus generally creates intensity, uh, stress, if it's really zoned in. And, and, and you'll notice that when someone approaches something very stressful, their eyes enlarge and they go into focusing narrowly on something, which is just trying to help you. However, it will create more of a stress response. And it's also, obviously, the stuff you're, you're teaching is relevant for hold downs as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what we do is activity that involves short breath holds similar to the times that you're wiping out for uh, with activity that you know is putting your body under stress from a heart rate perspective um, and then simulating or mimicking what goes on when you're wiping out so you're learning to hold your breath in a more controlled manner under a higher heart rate uh, which is real to surfing um, doing activity that is similar to a wipeout being spun around upside down back to front etc wrestling underwater those sorts of things that is trying to simulate as best we can 
what really happens. Yeah, and I guess on your course you get to you get to do that in a safe environment. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the whole ob- objective: is keep it very safe and progressive, so that you know you get tremendous change in a person over six to seven sessions. They have a, a massive shift in their performance when it comes to things like hold downs and then being able to reset body and mind after a challenging experience yeah and i'm i'm going to speculate here a little bit but i'm going to guess that a lot of drownings in surfing um are due to the amount of stress in the body yeah 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 and and, you know going into that fight or flight to an extreme level where you know, when it comes to breath regulation, you've you've got to learn to calm yourself, so that you're not burning as much oxygen and creating lots of carbon dioxide that will then lock muscles up. Yeah. And yeah, you can't swim out of things. You get you're you're fatiguing yourself through inappropriate breathing and movement. And even like I'm guessing, you know, when you're held under on on a in a big wave and you're getting tumbled, if you can. I mean, you're going to come up, right, eventually. Absolutely. And if you can remain calm, then you're conserving oxygen and limiting carbon dioxide, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. So so being very aware of the sensation of a wave holding you under, and then when it releases you, okay, it's time to come up. But don't try and come up whilst it's doing its thing and pounding you into the ocean. Yeah. Okay, so it's just as much as, as a... A safety course as it is a enhanced yeah. performance course, and then being realistic and you know getting the facts that you know potentially a six foot wave that you wipe out on you're underwater for about eight seconds, nine seconds maybe. Mm. It's not a long period of time, so manage that time. Yeah, it can, it can feel like a long time sometimes. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A that... bad time is a long time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you recommend counting uh, during a wipeout? Oh, look, you could. Um, I, I sort of, you know, recommend a number of different things, but but that can be a good thing. And another thing is, you know, just to be aware of the feeling of being moved, and when that intensity backs off, okay, it's time to come up. Um, you could put your your mind in a happy place and just enjoy the experience. Um, you can. Um, you know, be aware of an area of your body that isn't getting stressed at all, like your hands or your feet. Um, and then probably as importantly as all those things is, is just remembering not, not to breathe out when you wipe out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what about, the, have you heard of this guy called Wim Hof? I have heard of Wim Hof, yeah. Um, do you have an, an opinion on his work at all? Not really. I haven't really looked into it. A great deal. I um, I, you know, I think a lot of the, what I have seen, he, he he really does back his stuff on scientific evidence and so on. So, um, a little bit that I have seen, it's a lot of the information is quite quite in, interesting and and real. Um, I just haven't looked into it enough to sort of make an opinion on it, other than he is backing a lot of what he's saying with with good evidence. Yeah, yeah, I've looked into him a bit. He's I mean, there's no denying some of the stuff he's done and, you know, it's all through through breathing. And I guess part of the reason I mention that is it's just, I mean, we all, we all look at, you know, we've got food, you know. Yeah, food is an input that we need, you know, we can go 40 days without food, essentially. And we all know how the quality of our food uh, affects our bodies and, of course, the the way we eat, you know, whether we chew our food, our meal timing, etc., mm. also affects it. And then, you know, water, you know, we, we can go, you know, four or five days without water. But again, you know, the quality of our water and the timing of when when, and how much and how we drink our water is a, is a big thing. But you can only go without air for, for a few minutes. And we don't tend to <laughs> look into it that much, really. It's, it seems like there's a big mismatch there. And you look at someone like Wim Hof, who's gone to the extreme where he's doing these uh, quite full-on breathing practices but he he holds the world record for um you know swimming under the ice sitting in an ice bath for two hours without changing his core temperature 
I think he got only a few thousand feet short of the summit of Mount Everest in his shorts. I mean, this is just, <laughs> this guy is obviously, obviously he's been doing it for a long time, but it's just such a powerful message. Isn't it? You know what? Breathing, the way you breathe can affect your performance, your life, your health. and it's, Totally. It's, yeah, it's incredible. It's yeah. amazing. And it's, it's obviously it's something that, you know, surfing is, you spend a lot of time underwater holding your breath. Yeah. So it's just about conditioning, isn't it? And about an acceptance of some of the things that we go through and then, okay, well, what can we do to assist ourselves? Yeah. And to learn those practices and then to practice. And then you condition yourself into obviously coping better with what what comes. Yeah. And so I, there was a um, study that Red Bull um, did a while ago where they were measuring, measuring the brain waves of good surfers. And they found that a good surfer naturally will automatically, once they've um, got back out the back into safety and they're waiting for the next wave, they'll go into what's called alpha brain waves. Now, that's part of your nervous system and that can be affected by your breathing as well. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, so when we do a session, we always go into a, what we call a recovery mode where we spend eight to ten minutes on calming the breath right down uh, to a point where you know, every participant's sort of breathing maybe anywhere from one to four times in a minute, which is, you know, normally it's eight to ten without any effort. And in that process, it's doing specific things with the mind, which allows then um, the body to let go of tension. And then as that occurs, the nervous system will calm into what's called a parasympathetic state, which is a healing state. And in that state, we then influence the brain's brain its pattern in which it works so if there's obviously less stress based upon the way we breathe the way we think with these little practices that we do we can go into a very very deep parasympathetic state which induces this probably a bit deeper than that more of a theta state um, in the sessions that we run so a deep sleep is delta and we're going into theta which is a you know beautiful calming experience within the mind and body and through practice of doing that every session obviously then you can bring that into you know sitting at the back you can go into that place and and maybe not into deep theta but into alpha which is you know where flow and the ability to really sort of go with what is starts to happen yeah so you mentioned um, I've kind of already asked this question already but Let's reiterate it. So, in, in that case, in that situation where you, let's say you really want to, um, you know, increase your performance and you want to make sure that you, when you're sitting out the back, you're nice and relaxed and getting into alpha brain waves, is there a particular um, timing of breath that you recommend or is, is it again more back to that rhythm? Yeah, it's just, you know, using it potentially as a little focal point where you, you are following your breath with your mind and as you do that, you then allow um, you know, other areas of the body to relax too, in particular the jaw, um, that area, and then the chest and around the heart as you breathe out to soften those areas. The, the timing of the breath, again, is relative to, to the individual. But you know, if, you, if you'd aim for, as an example, might be five seconds in, five seconds out, something on, uh, around that time frame seems to be well connected to a very good heartbeat. Because most athletes or surfers, you know, resting heart rate is going down to sort of 60 to 70 beats per minute. So that would be quite easy to, to induce a five second in, five second out. And then once that's established to then, you know, just let go of tension so that finer motor skill can operate on a higher level. Okay. Cool. And so whereabouts are you, Nam? Whereabouts are you running these courses? All around the country, we um, on our website we just we send out um, information of where we'll be. So we, we run them in Sydney, Melbourne, Gold Coast every month, um, Perth, Newcastle, all, all around the country. We just we just yeah again we just send out the info on our website, and when you go to the website, you can you can see that where the next dates are and and the available spots, etc. Yep. Okay, and that's. BETtraining.com. Yep. Awesome. I'll put a link to that in, in the show notes as well. Yeah, perfect. 
And apart from working with surfers, are you working with um, people in, in any other capacity? Yeah, um, a number of different Olympic teams and individuals on all levels. So kayakers, swimmers, um, BMX guys, uh, runners, <laughs> you name it. Um, then uh, I work with the Titans often. So, so whenever I'm home, I'm, I'm doing a session with them at least once a week, once a fortnight. Um, and then a lot of business people really going to businesses and, and assisting them in um, stress management, but also in you know, utilizing a slightly different approach than most where we, where we focus on better physical performance through daily rituals, et cetera, that allows them to have better m- mental performance. So all scopes and, and breathing is always part of it because it's such an important part of, of living. Yeah. The, the oxygen efficiency, yeah. how does that work? I mean, kind of when you suggest that one could improve your oxygen efficiency, it, it almost is kind of stating that we're, um, we're oxygen gluttons. Yeah, well, we've got a lot of it in our body. It's uh, whether we can tap into it. So I'll give you an example of that. If I... If I'm a mouth breather, uh, when I'm breathing through my mouth, when, I'm not, when it's not necessarily meant to happen, in other words, um, I'm calm, I'm relaxed, but I'm using my mouth to breathe, I'll lower my carbon dioxide to a point where my blood becomes too alkaline and now the hemoglobin that carries oxygen around my body doesn't release the oxygen very well. So I become oxygen deficient through mouth breathing. Now, if I use my nose effectively and I'm breathing rhythmically evenly and low on the in-breath before I bring the air up into the top part of my lungs, I'm really allowing that that chemical formula, that acidity in my blood to be at an optimum where carbon dioxide, sorry, oxygen is released readily from hemoglobin. And now I'm getting more efficiency from my breath because I can now tap into it. So a simple example is hyperventilate for two minutes and you'll black out. How come? Well, you've got rid of so much carbon dioxide that now you can't extract oxygen from your hemoglobin cells because the acidity is lost. So it's a, it's a fine balance breathing. And if we get it right, the balance, we work in an optimum so we can tap into the oxygen that we have and if we really bolt on good breathing methods around intensive activity or intensive stress, we're optimizing our ability to tap into that oxygen content. And that's what our brain primarily wants when it's stressed, along with sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So the way you breathe affects the, uh, the, the acidity or the pH of your blood. That's right. Wow. And that, that needs to be at an optimum for good release of oxygen from hemoglobin. It's called the Bohr effect. Can you spell that? Yeah, B-O-H-R. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's probably what Wim Hof is doing a lot of. He, he does Absolutely. A... Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And if people eliminate too much CO2, which I have seen on a couple of clips, they, they pass out because mm. now they're locking the oxygen up. And, you know, <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good practice, but... Uh, it demonstrates things. <laughs> yeah. It's clear. Yeah. Um, so the opposite is true then if you were to breathe, you know, very evenly, rhythmically, but to the right areas of the lungs. Lower lobes potentially are absorbing a lot more oxygen than the upper part of the lungs, which is, you know, predominantly upper chest breathing. So over time, that percentage of how much is absorbed into the bloodstream is higher with better breathing. Therefore, you'll get more from each breath. Mm. It's also um, you know, in the training world. If you if you dive deep enough, you, you you learn that the diaphragm is actually the master muscle of the rest of your core. Of course. And when you breathe properly, you um, you improve the the sequencing and the firing capacity of your transverse abdominals and your obliques etc etc and you actually get a stronger more efficient core that allows your spine to move smoothly as well absolutely and therefore you know some of the activities that we get people to practice is diaphragmatic activity 
to increase the muscle brain connection so that the muscle and the brain are very well connected when under stress because that usually is lost when we get stressed things drop out of circuit could you give me an example of an exercise that might help yeah that? sure yeah we um we do what we call a diaphragm pump for a specific amount of time and it's breathing in and out through the nose um fairly rapidly for a period of time so it would sound like this <laughs> And all I'm doing is breathing in and out and predominantly activating diaphragm, um, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis to, to get the air in and out of the lower portion of my lungs. And if I do that at the rate that I just did for a period of time, I'm then in training those muscles to activate if my heart rate elevates, if I go under stress, they should come into play because I have entrained them to do so at that rate with that type of intensity. Wow, there's so much to breathing in the diaphragm. Yeah, we did a test with that. We got a 24% a change in thickness in the diaphragm through d those sorts of activities over a six-week period with just working on it eight minutes a day. Wow. Massive. Yeah, okay. Now, obviously, it's you know if you're going to practice any sort of breath hold work, you need to be with a partner. Uh, especially when it comes to water. But is there anything that one, if, if there's any surfers out there that are interested in, in increasing their breath hold time, is there any safe exercises they can do sitting on the couch? Sure, you could, you know, probably um, my, my advice is that you're not going for length of time in terms of, you know, let me see if I can do minutes and minutes on end. But potentially just getting comfortable uh, holding your breath for a short period of time, longer than what you need in the surf. So let's say we keep it under a minute, a 40-second breath hold. And you might repeat in the morning, you just do four breath holds. So you're just activating a breath hold sequence where you breathe in correctly, hold your breath for 40 seconds. Breathe out correctly, which is something that we teach in the courses breathe in again and hold for 40 and do that four times in a row. That's your little morning ritual to activate the ability for your brain to, to be okay and comfortable with a good amount of time holding your breath with minimal rest between each breath hold. And I wouldn't recommend doing any more than four breath holds in a sequence, but it's under 50 seconds, 40 seconds for each one. But you're, you're just going to that level where normal people will find it quite challenging to hold their breath in those, that sequence, where you're just getting comfortable with that. So when it comes to teaching people about breath holding, it's, it's getting comfortable with short breath holds where you're under a bit of pressure. So if you've only got a breath in and a breath out to recover between each breath hold, each one will be progressively harder, but it's not to a point where you're going to get low oxygen levels, etc. You're actually getting high carbon dioxide, which is what you want to build a tolerance to. Because that is the challenge in the surf. It's not lack of oxygen. It's excess carbon dioxide that creates the stressful feelings. So it's exposing yourself to that. Another simple way is, is to do you know, fairly intensive cardiovascular work so that your tolerance to climbing CO2 through sprint work will allow you to hold your breath for longer because you're more tolerant to that gas. Okay. And that's why you want to breathe out when you hold your breath. I'm actually developing a, an ebook with Mark Matthews and we're putting it together purely for people to train their capacity to hold their breath better in the surf without having to get in the pool. Awesome. I look forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be good. When's that due to be released? Oh, uh, look, shortly. We, we we're not too far away. We've, we've done a lot of filming on it and, and now we're just, just you know cleaning it up and, and getting the material out there and, and simple activities for people to follow that are very safe um, you know, no risk of any kind of uh, blackout material or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what about first thing in the morning, morning routines, morning breathing? What do you personally do? Yeah, always having a, a few minutes to just establish a nice rhythmic even breath. So it might be lying on my back and just being aware of my, my belly rising and falling as I breathe in and out so that I'm focusing my attention on that. So that then, you know, predominantly during the, the night of sleeping, you may have breathed erratically or snored or whatever. So you're, you're stabilizing 
the correct CO2 um, balance within your blood through breathing in for five, breathe out for five. For about a three to five minute period and then doing some diaphragmatic exercises to, to really encourage that strength in that area and connection to the brain and stimulating the nervous system into more of a switched on mode and then some simple um, in-breath muscle stretching and strengthening exercises. So that, that's just basically a lung pack where you're breathing in over a sequence of breaths to just activate the 10 in-breath muscles that we have and keeping the lungs functioning in its entirety so that when we go and do sport or you know, go into the rest of the day, all those muscles have been switched on, warmed up, stretched and strengthened so that should you need to breathe heavy, they're ready to do so. Cool. Cool, yeah. Morning routines are important. And hydrating, obviously, most important thing. Yeah. It's a good start to the day. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there's a little, um, on your website, there's a, there's a blog article on uh, confidence. Just reading off your website, it says, When you engage in self-doubt, there is a contraction of smooth muscle in your stomach area. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, so when we go into any kind of mental challenge, there's a predominant nerve that will send signals through and down to your diaphragm um, called the vagus nerve. And when that's stimulated, it's doing something very simple. It's, it's trying to get you to breathe a little bit more to help process whatever that you're going through in, in it could be self-doubt so if i go into self-doubt my mind is ticking over my brainwave pattern is increasing and for me to process what's going on i need more oxygen and the more oxygen content coming into my blood and therefore up to my brain the easier it is for my brain to process information so if i breathe effectively that smooth muscle that's contracting which is the diaphragm predominantly is now going into service and assisting me through the challenge. So if I go into stress and I'm going into doubt, a good place to start is just to pause and have a few even rhythmic breaths. And then in that moment, you're now shifting your attention to something that you can control and allowing the brain then to do its thing and help process whatever doubt you've gone into. Interesting. Okay, so it just comes back to rhythm again. Yeah, and evenness, making it rhythmic and even. Yeah. So I guess to, to kind of summarize what we've talked about so far, a, a good strategy for surfers will be to, when they're sitting out the back, sit in a nice, tall, relaxed posture with an unfocused gaze, being aware of one's peripheral vision and relaxing the eyes and breathing rhythmically. And evenly, yeah. And, and evenly and deeply as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, well, low first, then high. Yeah. So getting that, that action where the belly is activating that region, ideally out to the sides, not letting your abdominal wall just flop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, that, that would be great just for a few minutes. Yep. Okay. Awesome. And if... If folks listening out there want to learn more, then um, Nam mentioned an ebook that's coming out soon. But also, uh, yeah, you're doing the, the BET training courses all around the country. Yeah. And go and check out that website. And Nam, we're kind of running out of time. But before you go, I want to ask you a couple of quick fire questions. What's your favorite surfboard at the moment? I've got a Chris Garrett. Uh, it's um, it's a fish. Um, I just just love his shapes. I just think Chris makes a great board. Uh, that would probably be my favourite at the moment. Do you have a favourite surf movie or surf film? Mm. Mm. Good question. There's so many. There's many. <laughs> uh, a favourite when I was young was Big Wednesday. Oh, that was a cracker. Yep. Um, I'll leave it at that. Cool. Do you have a, a favorite surfer? Uh, Mick. Mick, good choice. Nam, thank you so much for your time. Uh, invaluable. Loads of good tips on uh, and during this podcast, probably worth multiple listens, um, considering that breathing is such an important topic. Yeah, absolutely. 
And Magic. And thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Awesome. So that website, again, is bettraining.com. And if you just Google Nam Baldwin, it, it'll, it'll come up anyway. And uh, I hope to see you on one of those courses soon as well, Nam. Next time you're yeah, in, in, in Sydney, I'm going to jump on. So. Oh, please do. Yeah, that'd be great. Love you too. Awesome. Thank you. So welcome. Thanks for tuning in to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Frampton. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with the latest interviews. Please share with your friends. Check us out uh, on Facebook at uh, Surf Mastery Surf. And if you're on iTunes, please go and give us a little rating. That'd be awesome. Until next time, keep surfing.